All right, joining us now is a gentleman who takes the next step in the Bellator Bantamweight Grand Prix this Friday on Showtime live when he takes on Leandro Ego. It's the man himself, Danny Sabatello. Hi, Danny. How are you? Good, man. How are you doing? Good, Danny. You're quite the character. So I was looking up some of your social media profiles and your Twitter bio is just fuck you. <laughs> That's <laughs> that is all that it says. Boy, I, you are sending quite the signal to the world, are you not? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much just an outline of what I think of most of these people. Um, I, you know, I go in these comment sections about me and these people are talking shit about me. I uh, just kind of showing them that I don't really give a fuck what they say. I'm always going to talk trash. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but that's just who I am. And I'm going to be authentic to who I am. You know, I'm never going to change that no matter what. And I just want people to understand that if you don't like me, I don't like you either. So if you don't like me, go fuck yourself. Have you always been this way? Because I feel like, you know, someone who was big into wrestling one time made a point to me. He was like, you know, after a big fight, you'll see guys embrace. But in wrestling, they can barely shake hands. Did you get the did you get like a bit of the attitude from wrestling or did you get into wrestling because of the attitude? Yeah, I mean, I've just been this way my whole life. You know, it doesn't matter what we're doing, whether it's a wrestling match or a thumb war. I'm always going to hate the opponent that's going up against me. You know, I take everything so personal. If I think this guy is trying to beat me and embarrass me in front of my friends and family in any sort of fashion with competition, it doesn't sit well with me. So I'm obviously going to talk shit because I honestly just don't like them for it, you know? So I, I think these guys that they go into these fights and, and they shake hands and they hug or whatever, they have this false sense of security. They kind of want it to be a comfortable fight where, oh, if this guy likes me, that maybe I won't get hurt. Maybe I won't lose brain cells or anything like that. Where I come from, man, I'm trying to rip your fucking head off. I don't need that false sense of security. I don't need that comfort. Um, no matter what we're doing when we're competing, I'm going to be trying to rip your head off. I'm going to do whatever I can within the rule set to fucking break your head mentally. Um, and yeah, that's just who I've been. Uh, I was that way in wrestling. I was always getting in fights in the middle of matches. Before the matches, I was always trying to get in my guys' heads. Um, but, you know, again, it is, it isn't, it doesn't matter what it is. I'm going to try and get in their head and I'm going to talk shit and, and I'm always going to fucking hate whoever lines up next to me. You know, you, you have to know this already, though. Like, it's almost a good thing that the fans talk shit about you, right? Because that means that they're going to be like dying to watch you lose or that, that in general, they're just making attention about you. And in this business, that actually benefits you. Yeah, I mean, I don't really give a fuck. I, I love it when the fans are saying how, oh, rip his head off or oh, go die. It doesn't matter to me whether you're on my side or against me. I don't really give a fuck. I actually have more fuel in the tank when I ha hear people heckle me. It kind of pisses me off a little bit more. Kind of makes me want to fucking show them, go fuck yourself. Uh, but yeah, I know it's good for business, but no matter what, that's just that's just who I am. Um, it doesn't really matter if it's good for business or bad for business. Fortunately enough, it's good for business when people are talking about me and hating on me. Um, but again, Man, I don't give a fuck. You can love me. You can hate me. I don't really care. The fact of the matter is most of fight fans don't know what the fuck they're talking about anyways. So I don't give a shit. You know, I got that close friends, close family, close teammates that ride with me. That's all I really need. You know, the fans that, that really understand the sport, I think like me because they understand how skillful I am in that cage and how electric I am outside the cage. But that's just my personality. That's no persona. That's nothing like that. Um, so again, if you're riding with me, I do appreciate it. I love it. You're probably a huge fan of the sport. You probably understand the sport. But if you're not riding with me, I don't give a fuck. Go fuck yourself. Let's back up a step because I want to talk about the ego fight and then the, the, the Grand Prix in general in just a moment. But let, let's start with some bit of your background. So you wrestled at Purdue. And for MMA fans who may not know, John Fitch famously wrestled there as well. I'm wondering, you know, because I, I spoke to Johnny Eblen, there's like a bunch of guys at the University of uh, Missouri. They all kind of went from uh, college wrestling to MMA. Did Fitch ever reach out? Like, how did you get from the pipeline of D1 wrestler to now MMA fighter out of ATT? Yeah, so I grew up wrestling. I started at the age of four um, with always the intent. Once my wrestling career was done, I was going to transition into MMA. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes it was just a little bit difficult staying focused on wrestling just because, man, MMA and fighting has always been my true love. That's always been my passion. Um, but I always wanted to keep a tunnel vision on wrestling and accomplish my goals. But with John Fitch, yeah, he wrestled at Purdue. He came back um, maybe once or twice while I was there. Um, I didn't really know him too well, but it was awesome to have him in the room just because of how much success he's had in the sport. Uh, but he didn't really alter my views on it or anything. I wasn't really too close to him. was always a huge fan of him just because he was a Purdue wrestler transitioning into MMA. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I always just knew I was going to fight. I've been a fighter, you know, I was good at wrestling because I'm a good fighter. Um, and obviously with this wrestling base, it's huge in fighting and not just because of the technique or anything, but wrestling mindset is just a little bit different than these guys. We're just a little bit tougher and harder around the edges. You know, we have no quitting us we're, and we're just going to be relentless on whatever we fucking want. Um, so a lot of times people think, oh, this guy's a wrestler. He's got good ground game. He's got the skill set, but it's really honestly just more, for, more than that. We're a little bit more mentally tough than these guys. You know, I don't want to say that boxing or, or jujitsu or Muay Thai or anything is, is less than us, but they really are. You know, the wrestlers are, are the Kings. We are the hardest guys. We have the best mentality. We have the best mindset. Um, and that's why we dominate in this sport of uh, fighting and MMA, just because we're a little bit of a different breed. Um, but yeah, I always knew I was going to go into fighting, was always fucking pumped. Had to keep my sights on wrestling, but you know, it's hard when you just have this true love of fighting. And, and now that I'm fighting right now, sky's going to be the limit. You know, I'm only, I've only been in this for four years, maybe now. Mm. Um, and it's just going to get better and better. Yeah. You're, you're going your, for four years in fighting. You have gone quite far. So how did you end up at ATT? Yeah. So I'm originally from Chicago. After I graduated from Purdue, I moved back to Chicago and all my buddies were in the city also at that time. So it was kind of just party capital. It was also the time that the Cubs won the World Series and Wrigley Field is like a half a mile away from my apartment at the time. So it was right after they won the World Series. I was just partying for like a week straight. I think I was drunk literally two weeks straight with my boys. Um, and I kind of just sat down and I realized if I want to accomplish what I want to accomplish in this sport, I'm going to have to make a drastic change. You know, this lifestyle isn't one of a world champion. So if I'm going to do something, I got to do it big. I got to get out of Chicago. I can't have too much influence on me. Why not go to the best gym in the world down in South Florida at American Top Team? That's what I did. I had no connections. I had no in. I didn't even mm. know anybody in the state of Florida. So it was pretty crazy. I, I pretty much just showed up on their doorstep. Kind of was just like, hey, I'm here. You guys better let me in. Um, and that's just kind of how it rolled. You know, I, I really wanted to go to the best gym. Um, and since I was leaving my comfort zone and leaving Chicago, obviously, I, why not go to the best gym? And American Top Team is the best gym. So I decided on that. Um, and it's just been the best thing ever since. It was the greatest decision of my life. You know, not only is it in the fucking greatest place, you know, that that son is the best. But, you know, the training you can't beat, the training partners you can't beat. And uh, all my coaches are just the best in the world as well. Was it how, how weird was it early on when no one knew you? But obviously, once they figured out you had some ability, I'm, I'm guessing you thrashed a couple people along the way. What was that early transition period where you were kind of like, making a name for yourself inside the gym, but still you're, it's, you're something of an unknown figure. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it was very wild just because I didn't know anybody at that gym. Um, and even when I showed up the first day, I kind of snuck in hoping that nobody would recognize me, but Richie, the manager was like, who the fuck are you? What's going on here? And I kind of just told him my situation. And I was like, listen, I just moved down here. Um, I didn't know I had to like reach out to anybody. I thought I could just show up, you know, I kind of just played dumb. Uh, we laugh about it to this day. But thank God that they let me in. Um, and yeah, obviously when I was there, I would hold my own in the grappling category. So they knew I had a bright future ahead of me. Um, they looked up my career in wrestling and they were obviously excited about it. But prior to that, I had no fucking combat history. I don't know how to throw a fucking punch. I don't know jujitsu. I didn't even know what the fuck it was. Mm. Um, so it was obviously a steep hill. But, you know, when you have that wrestling mentality, you know, I'm, I'm going to the gym twice a day, every day until I'm the best. And, and they saw that. Um, so I, I kind of caught on fairly quickly you know I still got a lot to learn in my career but where I'm at right now I'm pretty comfortable um I, I still think right now I'm the best in the world at bantamweight and I'm looking forward to prove that just because I have the opportunity with this Bellator Grand Prix that once I win this tournament it will mean I'm the best Bellator bantamweight it will mean I'm the best bantamweight um and I'm just excited to showcase the skills Dude, it's crazy. Like, you know, everyone wants to paint the people who came in as alternates or whatever as like, oh, it's the Daniel Cormier story. But when I look at what happened, especially in your last fight against Lugo, which at least on paper was competitive and then reality was was not competitive. Um, you kind of ran over him. You legitimately have a chance to win this entire thing. You start with Leandro Eagle. Let's let's go there first. Size him up as an opponent for me. When you when you look at the challenge at hand, what is it? Yeah, immediately what jumps off the page to me is that he fucking sucks. Um, I, I don't see this as being a competitive fight. I know he's got a little bit of a jujitsu game, so I got to be somewhat careful, somewhat safe on the ground. He could try to snatch up my neck at any moment, but I don't think the skill set with him is that high. Um, it's nothing that I haven't seen before. 
you know, I'm going with guys at ATT, like Pedro Munoz. He's got one of the best guillotines in the UFC. So I've been stopping that. And if I can stop that on him, I can stop that on Higo. Um, other than that, he's, he's not very good of a fighter. You know, on the feet, he doesn't really offer too much of a threat. On the ground, other than that guillotine, he doesn't have too much. Um, so I, I am looking forward to going there and smashing him and breaking him. Um, this is a guy that I fucking hate. This is a guy that is disrespectful to MMA because he misses weight all the fucking time. His last two fights, he missed weight. And even before that, he's missed weight a couple of times. So I feel like it's my duty to go in there to torture him, to slice him up, give him stitches for the rest of his life. My, uh, my goal going into this fight is to scar him for the rest of his life. I want him to remember this fight. Um, that's just because this one's personal, but obviously they're all personal. This one just a little bit more so than the others. Um, but again, in terms of his skill set, uh, I don't see it as too much of a problem. I want to go in there and I want to dominate. You know, I don't want to go in there and finish him in the first round and give him, you know, somewhat of a lucky fucking performance just because he didn't get to be tortured. I want to drag him into that those championship rounds because all these fights are five rounds. I want that fourth round to just be the worst experience of his life. I want to slice him open, get him tired, make him want to quit. Don't finish him yet. Right when he wants to quit, don't finish him yet. Just torture him a little bit more and then get the fucking finish in that fourth round. Bro, you're a sadist. Jesus. Um, do you... Ima okay, let me ask you this way. Do you have any level of concern he's going to miss weight this Thursday? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, he, he's mentally weak. He's a mental midget. That's also why I'm going to take advantage of it in the fight, but I actually do think he's going to miss weight. Um, he hasn't made the weight in a, in a long time, but you know what? I was talking to the head, uh, the owner of ATT, Dan Lambert about this the other day. You know, I just can't think about that. That is out of my control. What am I going to do about that? It doesn't matter regardless we're fighting. You know, I've been telling everybody, even if he does fucking miss weight, I, I am going to accept the fight. No matter what we are going to fight. Um, and even if he misses weight by a large margin and the commission doesn't sanction the fight, I'm going to find him in the parking lot, throw his head through a fucking car window. Um, so either way, June 24th in Connecticut, we're going to be fighting. So it doesn't matter whether he makes the weight or doesn't make the weight. We are going to fight. I don't think he'll make the weight. I hope he makes the weight just because, you know, MMA fans are sick of people not fucking making weight. It's a big problem with this industry. You know, people say and volunteer that they're going to do something and they don't fucking do it. You know, no one is forcing us to go to these weight classes. No one's forcing us to say, hey, I'll make bantam weight. You know, it's us making the decision. So it's just, it's crazy that these guys are missing weight after volunteering. Um, so I'll, again, I hope he does make the weight. Um, but regardless, we're fighting June 24th. All right. So here's the interesting part about this. Assuming you win on Friday, which is certainly a very possible, if not likely thing. The fight after that would be for the, basically the interim title. It would be against Ralphie and Stotts. Let's go through the rest of the people in this tournament and see what you make of them what do you make of ralphie and stats yeah he might be the most overhyped fighter in the history of fighting i think he's not very good i think he's slow one-dimensional and sucks you know in his last fight against juan archuleta i actually had him down on the scorecards two rounds and when you look at that fucking head kick that he had it wasn't the foot or the shin that caught juan it was the knee and it was because juan was a little bit too close so it's not like stats set this up and, and trapped him in that cage and, and got him with a good head kick. It's because Archuleta kind of walked into it and it was just a sloppy head kick that shouldn't have done any damage. Um, so yeah, that's a fight that I'm very much looking forward to. I think that's going to be the biggest fight in Bellator bantamweight history. Uh, I'm fucking stoked about that fight, but it's hard to get excited about that fight when I got to keep tunnel vision on the Seago fight. You know, sometimes these fighters get in trouble when you overlook an opponent and you start mm. thinking of the next round and all that. So obviously my sights right now are just set on torturing and beating the fuck out of Higo June 24th. But man, that, that stats fight is going to be absolutely sick. It's going to be huge. I see myself dominating him. I actually see that fight as an easier fight than this Higo fight, just because stats, I, I don't see anywhere that he could possibly finish me. You know, he's not very good on the ground. He's not very good on the feet. He doesn't have finishing capabilities to me and either of those categories. So I think that's a fight where I just torture him and dominate him and not really have to worry too much about him finishing me and slipping up and making this slight mistake where he capitalizes. That's, that's going to be a very fun fight. So then let me ask you this way. In the finals of the tournament, right? Let's say you move to the finals. Who do you anticipate fighting on the other side of the bracket? Who do you see as on the other side of the bracket, perhaps the, the leading contender on, on, the other, on the other side? Yeah, it's either going to be Barzola or Magomedov in the finals with me. Um, they have patchy mix, depending on whoever wins June 24th. Um, and, and I think mix sucks. Uh, he's not very good at all. 
if he gets your back, he's pretty good. That's his whole game plan. You know, get the guys back, get that figure four in and, and try and fucking stall out the fight. That's what he did against Kyoji Horiguchi. That's what he's going to do next round. Um, but other than that, if he doesn't get that, he fucking is brutal. He's brutal to watch. He's boring to watch. He's terrible. Um, so I think either Barzola or Magomedov is going to beat him. And then between Barzola and Magomedov, I really don't know. I think that's actually going to be a very good fight June 24th. It's the fight before me, mine. So while I'm warming up, I'm going to be watching a little bit just because it's going to be entertaining and I am going to be scouting a little bit. Um, it's going to be a very entertaining and close fight. I see those dudes just slugging it out. Um, if I were to pick, I would say Barzola pulls off the upset, um, mm. but I really don't know. So the way I see it, it's me and Barzola in the finals, but you know what? This is fighting, and if your hands are out of placement for one fucking second, say goodnight. It's over, so a lot can fucking happen, but if I were to bet on it, I would bet on myself and Barzola in that finals. Interestingly enough, I, I'm curious, with the your style of, of trash talk, has Bellator, or you know, actually, let me back up a step, the way you present yourself. Has Bellator said that they like it, dislike it? Have they commented to you privately at all? Because I got to say, for Bellator, th this is a breath of fresh air, I, uh, probably. Yeah, I think they're actually totally understanding that they got a star under their hands and it's only going to get better. I could feel themselves pushing me a little bit more, you know, but they don't really say anything. They don't offer advice. They don't want me to veer from anything. I did have a conversation with someone and they were just like, hey, listen, just be yourself. You're obviously electric as a person and you're electric in the cage. So I think it's just good for both parties. You know, when I do this stuff, this isn't a front. This isn't some showcase. You know, I'm not just some cheesy, corny guy making up lines. I don't script anything. I'm not being anybody. I'm not. You can ask anybody. I know this is just how I am. It's fortunate enough for fighting. Um, and again, what helps out is me winning. You know, you can talk all the trash you want, but if you don't go in that cage and you don't win, it's just fucking empty barrels, you know? So the good thing is I'm a very, very elite fighter, best in the world. And I'm very, very good trash talker. So those are the best two things that you want. And I think Bellator absolutely recognizes that. I see myself being the, the face of Bellator. Um, and, and the only thing I got to keep doing is just being myself and uh, do what I know. And that's just talking trash and winning. So obviously, June 24th, it's going to be a big step for me. I got to go in there and torture this motherfucker again. Uh, not just win, you know, again, with these fights, I like dominating them. I want people to not be able to say, Oh man, he go slipped up. He got caught. He would win in another fight. No, I want to leave no doubt that I fucked these dudes up. And that's why people are kind of just hopping on my train is because they understand how skillful I am and just electric across the way. You know, the talking doesn't ever stop. You know, going into these fights, a lot of people say, Oh, the talking's over. Time to fight. No, fuck that. The talking's never done. Where I'm going to talk all up until the fight. And when we're in that cage, I'm going to be talking in his ear. I'm going to be getting his head during the fucking fight. So I'm always talking. And I'm always going to be winning. Bellator recognizes they have a star on their their uh, hands. I'm going to be the face of this fucking thing. And it's going to be fucking awesome. All right. Tell me the coldest thing you ever told an opponent, either in MMA or wrestling. What's the coldest thing you've ever said to an opponent when you were, let's say, beating them up or dominating them? I don't want to say it on air just because I want my opponents to hear it once they're in there, dog tired, bloody all over their fucking face. And they hear my lines. All right. Fair enough. Um, Let's see, when you think about in the game who has done it the right way, I'm not saying you want to copy them. That's not my, that's not my question. But my question is when you're like, well, that, that guy did it the right way. I like how they did it. Who do you say as someone who really did it well in your estimation? Yeah, I mean, it's got to be Conor McGregor and Chael Sonnen. Um, those are two guys that not only when you look at their trash talking, again, you got to look at their resume in the cage and they were absolutely relentless on their way to championships. Um, so obviously guys that win a championship, I'm going to want to try to just mimic their style a little bit and take something here and there from them. You know, I'm not trying to copy anybody. I don't want to be like anybody. When people say, if you compare yourself to anybody, I always say nobody just because nobody's like me. I'm not like any of these other fighters. I don't try to be, um, but when you look at these guys and you got to show respect for them, it's obviously Connor and Chael just because they've done so much for this sport. You know, they did it the right way. They were smart about their business and they were themselves. You know, a lot of these guys are unauthentic to themselves. The good thing about them is that, you know, these fans can kind of tell if a guy is fake and just saying some bullshit, you know, with those guys, they were just themselves and they were themselves their whole fucking career. So those are two guys that I think are, are very good in the sport. And you know what, you got to show some respect sometimes. And those are guys that, demand respect because you know what they've they've made mma come a long way you know the ufc wouldn't be what it is without fucking connor that's the fact of the matter 
You know, you can love him. You can hate him. It doesn't fucking matter. But the guy has done so much for the sport. Um, and I kind of want to be one of those guys where I change the sport. You know, I want to make Bellator just the biggest and baddest fucking promotion there ever was. And I want to be Bellator till the day I die. I want to retire with Bellator, but I want to be coming to the face of this fucking organization. And I'm just going to make it uh, amazing and take it to new heights. All right. So then the opposite question, who is someone that is really popular that like just did it the wrong way? Like the exact opposite of Danny Sabatello. Henry Cejudo. Yeah. I, I just think he's just absolutely corny. He's terrible. I can't even watch him fucking talk. It's just so cheesy and cringe. And he's like the king of cringe, but it's not like funny. Like he'll say some fucking scripted line. And I just think it's dumb as fuck. I want to slap the shit out of him whenever he fucking talks. I, I don't think it's good. That's another example of, man, the fans can see that you're fake. Why are you fucking doing it like this? Um, that's not who you are. And this isn't WWE. This isn't fake wrestling. You know, this is fighting. We go in there and beat the fuck out of each other. So why are you even doing this? Um, so, yeah. Also, another guy, Colby, I, I don't like the shticks. To me, just be authentic to yourself. Maybe bring it out a little bit. Um, but but don't be fake. And those guys are fucking fake as shit. Fair enough. Uh, Danny, I got to tell you, I was blown away by your performance against Lugo even before that. But that one really was a, a bit of a, a high mark in your career to date. Cannot wait to see what happens on Friday. I, you know, I know you don't need luck, but I wish you luck just the same. Appreciate your time. And uh, here comes the Danny Sabatello experience. Yes, sir. Thank you very much.